Our next panel will be discussing sustaining of beneficial grazing on protected lands. And it's my honor to introduce Sheila Berry to moderate this panel. Sheila is a UC Cooperative Extension Livestock Natural Resources Advisor. So with that, Sheila, take it away. Um, yes, so we're gonna hear from managers of protected public lands about the role of grazing and meeting conservation goals, and also about challenges to keeping ranching viable as a, as a land management resources, as a resource. And we have ex today an example from both the uh, southern part of our state and northern part of our state, and we're going to start in the south. And I, this this is also we we haven't had um, uh, for sure in the past at our summit meetings um, much from sort of south of the Tehachapi's, but um, so today we have um, from San Diego County um, from both the Forest Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife who are working together in on some rangeland management there. So I'm gonna turn this over to, um, first to Lance Criley. He's a range management specialist with the US Forest Service and he'll be joined with Tracy Nelson who is a reserve uh, manager with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they'll have about a 15 uh, minute presentation. Then we'll hear from um, our next uh, speaker and then have all the questions at the end for both of them. So Lance. Great. Yeah, I'm uh, very appreciative to be able to share a, a perspective from way south of the grapevine. I feel like sometimes we're, we're a little on the periphery, both geographically and in the, in the conversation. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Sheila said, I'm, I'm the rangeland management specialist for the Cleveland National Forest, which makes up much of Eastern San Diego County. Um, and also uh, makes up the Santa Ana Mountains, which straddles Orange and Riverside counties. And I've worked in San Diego, San Diego County as a ranch manager since the early 2000s. Um, and one of the questions I get asked most when I tell people from other parts of the state or country where I work is, you have cattle grazing down there? Um, and I, the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, but the question illustrates some of the challenges faced by both livestock producers and land managers down here. Um, cattle and other livestock have often not been imagined to be part of the landscape. And in recent years, they actually have not been part of the landscape in many places. Um, of course, San Diego has a long history of grazing and a long history of intense development pressure and a host of unique wildlife and plant species, many federally listed. Uh, San Diego County is considered one of, or some people will even go so far as to say the most biologically diverse county in the nation. Uh, with over 200 special status species currently recognized. All this means that San Diego County is, I think, in many ways, a bit farther down the road, or at least a road, uh, towards something like the 30 by 30 concept than many other parts of the state. And I think we're a good case study for some of the challenges that could be coming. Um, San Diego County, of course, has you know, had a long history of domestic livestock grazing. Uh, we were the first place in Alta, California, where the Spanish introduced livestock. Um, much of the land base and coastal and inland valley areas were designated as ranchos, or maybe the better word is appropriated for ranchos. Um, and settlers arriving later used the Homestead Act. Using the Homestead Act, were able to establish some very large ranching operations in the county as well. Um, so many of the ranchos now are part of the urban build out, um, with many suburbs bearing the name of the rancho that they were previously. Um, others have become parts of Indian uh, Native American reservations. Uh, the largest became Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base and others became state parks and game preserves um, where grazing was eliminated. Um, I should note that San Diego County is still home to the largest intact privately held rancho in California that is still being used for a livestock operation and that's Rancho Guajito. So with the extensive development pressure and the abundance of special status species, um, San Diego, I think was one of the first counties in, this, in the state to adopt a large regional multiple species habitat conservation plan, MSCP, um, in 1997. And while the history of all the sub plans and everything is way too much to go into, 
uh, much progress has been made to actually establishing these reserve areas, um, especially in the South County, where uh, um, the South County MSCP was actually officially adopted. Um, and currently, uh, I've heard estimates that about 80% of the planned reserve preserve areas have been acquired under some sort of protected status. Um, and of course, that's a, you know, a huge mix of owners and managers uh, from federal, state, county, and city governments, irrigation districts, down to a wide variety of land trust conservancies um, and you know, mitigation banks managed by various entities. And of course, many of these large and valuable landscapes that were available for conservation were working ranch, working rangelands. So ranch, uh, ranching has been in decline in San Diego County over the last half a century or more for a myriad of reasons, uh, development and urban expansion being the largest. Um, but the transfer of much of the ranching land base into various holdings for open space and species conservation has also been an undeniable factor. Cattle were removed from many properties in the name of species protection, as well as increasing restrictions to grazing from endangered species on other lands like the Cleveland National Forest. And this article in 2007 um, really probed into that, that process. Um, but around the publication of this rather uh, grim piece, um, things were already starting to reverse course in terms of increasing awareness of the value of working rangelands and the benefits of livestock grazing for the management of certain resources. Um, I remember the author of this piece calling me and he was very surprised to be finding out that a lot of land managers and environmental groups were starting to talk about preserving ranching in the county. So in general, there, you know, as already stated in other presentations, there's been an increasing awareness of the value of livestock for controlling non-native grasses and forbs and to maintain habitat characteristics for many species. Um, and to reduce fire risk, of course, is the latest. Um, so for example, in the forest, the national forest, we've been seeing increasing flexibility for managing livestock around endangered species. Um, like in this meadow on Mount Palomar that hosts the endangered Laguna Mountain Skipper uh, and a small endangered grass called the San, San Bernardino bluegrass. And I believe if you look in the distance there, you'll see a current easement that the Rangeland Trust put together in Mendenhall Valley. Um, the county itself has also maintained grazing on many of their, their lands and has been increasingly using cattle to manage for certain species. Uh, most well known at a place called Ramona Grasslands, where for cattle or uh, managing vernal pools and also to maintain habitat structure for raptors. Um, and there on other reserve lands, there's been increasing interest in bringing livestock back. Um, and probably the largest landscape in San Diego County where cattle have been returning is Rancho Humul Ecological Preserve and the adjoining Hollabit Canyon. And that's what my co-presenter Tracy will be talking about in just a few minutes. Um, but there's many challenges. Um, to using livestock to, to manage lands in San Diego County, and especially to bring livestock back to places where they've been removed. Um, and ranchers, of course, you know, face many challenges, um, just in terms of challenges around the, you know, working in a much reduced ranching economy. Um, so that, you know, ranchers here face the same challenges that ranchers in the entire state face, but I feel like the hurdles here are a little bit, set a little bit higher. Um, so talking to producers here, one of the biggest issues for them is, is a very limited access to markets. So the nearest uh, auction for calves is north of Bakersfield for ranchers in San Diego County, which adds huge transportation costs and other costs. Um, and there's only one slaughterhouse in all of Southern California and it's a small, small operation. So there's only one place that you could manage kind of a direct consumer model. Um, and with the reduced sort of size of the ranching economy, just, you know, just little things like access to vet services, access to getting brand inspections timely, um, all add challenges. And of course, working around a very urbanized landscape and around open space preserves that allow recreation um, adds to increased costs due to cut fences, liability. Um, and like elsewhere in the state, drought and fire have been 
increasingly a challenge for producers. And despite the increased interest in grazing as a management tool in the county, there are still few available leases on public and reserved lands. Now for land managers, uh, they also face many challenges uh, to bringing cattle back. Um, so in San Diego County, many of the lands where, man where managers are looking to return livestock have not had grazing in many years. After such long absences, infrastructure needs to be reestablished with very high costs and a lot of time devoted to developing new leases and permits. Many of the lands are relatively small holdings with a variety of managers, land trusts, firms that manage the easements, uh, bought as mitigation for the MSCP preserve, county and state entities, and the larger landscapes have a mix of these ownerships. Very few of these entities have livestock or range management experience on their staffs or experience managing grazing leases on their lands. So this has led to a huge issue around just comfort to bringing livestock back uh, and a lot of uncertainty about how exactly bringing livestock back on properties might impact these lands and species that they are managing for. But on the flip side, as one land manager has said in reference to abundant weed invasions, we know what happens when we do nothing. I have observed that the lack of experience around grazing on these lands has also led to the feeling that grazing for production and profit is somehow different or incompatible with grazing for resource benefits. And there's a perception that the latter, grazing for resource benefits requires intensive prescriptive grazing or complicated holistic grazing approaches, in quotes. Um, and this has led to a lot of hesitation, a little bit of analysis paralysis, I would say, um, or making leases so restrictive that no producer would be able to take or interested in taking a lease. There's also a feeling that San Diego County and that the wildlife and plant species here are different enough from the rest of California that more science is needed on livestock grazing impacts here specifically. Um, and reserve man before reserve managers feel comfortable bringing on livestock. There's also not much institutional help down here for land managers or for ranchers. There are a few working certified range managers in the county. Um, and there is no UC Livestock Extension Advisor south of the Grapevine. NRCS does have a few positions that lend technical support in livestock management. And the San Diego Resource Conservation District recently has been much more active in developing programs for ranchers, including something called the Rancher to Rancher Program, which is kind of a round table amongst producers here, trying to build technical support in the county. Um, so an interesting effort to help break through some of the discomfort around bringing cattle back um, is being funded by an institution called the San Diego MMP, Management and Monitoring Program, which is a pretty unique uh, organization that was funded through a uh, sales tax as part of a big tr uh, transportation bill. Um, and their work is to really coordinate monitoring and science around all the various ownerships of the MSCP lands and do monitoring for the target species. Um, but they also recently started funding a, um, a large study to address grazing impacts specific to the species of concern in San Diego County. And they were managed, able to bring down sort of the, the UC Berkeley Brain Trust um, to run this study and it's currently underway. And while I was complaining about the lack of CRMs in the county, at least now, as you can see pictured there in number front, we have, uh, we're currently home to CRM number one, Dr. Bartolome, who now resides in San Diego County. So we got that going for us. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn, turn this over to Tracy, who's gonna talk about the Rancho Femul Ecological Reserve and the challenges she's been facing actually bringing cattle back to a large landscape in the county. You there, Tracy? Uh, I'm here, Lance. All right, let's go to your slides. Okay, as Lance, I think you nailed that with regard to uh, land manager challenges. So thank you for that. Um, I'm Tracy Nelson. I'm a reserve manager, uh, one of three for uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, responsible for around 20,000 acres, but we're gonna talk about two properties that make up about 12,000 acres of that 20. 
um, uh, I include my my ranching cattle partners uh, logo here for horse for J horse and livestock, um, which is owned and managed by uh, John Ostell, who is a participant here today. So if you have questions that might be better related to him, he'll be here to answer that. Uh, anyway, I, I think probably the most important point I could make here is that none of this would be possible if you don't have a good relationship with your rancher. Down here in Southern California, there's not a lot of ranchers that are even available. And of those very few that are willing to really interact with us. And so I'm very fortunate to have John as my partner. Um, the healthier that relationship between a conserved land manager and their ranching partner, the more productive uh, and better the results. Forward slide. So this is a, an outline of uh, Rancho Hamul and Hollenbeck Canyon Wildlife Area to give you an idea on location. So we're about less than 20 miles actually due east of downtown San Diego. So we're not far out of uh, what most people think of as San Diego. Um, and it's funny, you ask half the people in downtown, they don't, they don't even know we're out here. Uh, anyway, this is a two, uh, 1985 satellite image with the perimeter uh, shown. And it shows you just how much uh, agriculture, uh, including grazing, occurred on the properties before they were acquired and conserved. Um, and in these areas that have a long history of agriculture, not just grazing, but also uh, you know, crop cultivation, these areas are a real challenge to manage, uh, especially since, you know, since it, for, for 20 years, there were no cattle on the property. They were, the fields were left uh, fallow. And so how do you make those valuable to wildlife was a big challenge. Um, that's a long time to go for these fallow fields and they, they don't recover on their own. So, um, next slide. So this is a good example of what those field looks, fields look like in the spring following, you know, a, an average or above amount of rainfall. Uh, believe it or not, there is a road there. Um, and we just tap a lot of fuel in the property. And this has very little value biologically for the species that exist down here in Southern California. This should be what you should see in the background is some healthy coastal sage scrub with really you know, no grasses um, or few bunch grasses. And in the interstitial space should be exposed soils. We don't have that now. Um, this property is burned a number of times. Uh, and you see, not just down here in the, in the fields, but in the background on the hill, you see a partial type conversion. And that's just leading to further, uh, uh, you know, more uh, frequent burns. Next slide. Lance? Oh, there you go. Okay, so this was a recent burn. Um, and you can see right here in the foreground, there's four feet of grass sitting there ready to burn. We got lucky. Uh, it actually got stopped at the road, but because of this fire, we did some expansion uh, of grazing, uh, not just down here in the field, we expanded it up into the ecological sites uh, where we do have coastal sage scrub species. Um, at one time grazing, or my, initially my goal for introducing or reintroducing grazing to the, to the properties was to provide value to wildlife resources such as raptors and other avian species. And uh, fuel management was my secondary goal. Now fuel management and many of my, our, our units here is the number one priority. Um, but, and we also still prioritize uh, raptors, particularly um, 
one particular species is burrowing owl. Next slide. I see just two more minutes, okay? Okay, well, I, 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 yeah, I'm just about done. Um, so this is a picture in 2014. Uh, this was the re re initial reintroduction and there in the front is an artificial burrow for a burrowing owl. Next slide. Uh, down. There we go. That's a photo of the burrowing owls. And this has been a really, really uh, successful program in recent years after partnering with the zoo, but it's not possible without the cattle. And then I, I, I think there's just one more. These are some other species here that benefit from our grazing program. Um, so we can't, we can't meet the goals of, you know, uh, servicing or managing the property for wildlife, uh, particularly, you know, a lot of these species without the grazing program. And that's it. Uh, thank you. And we will um, hold questions, but please put them in the chat and um, we're gonna move to Lewis uh, Reed now. So Lewis is in uh, San Mateo County. So that's in the Northern, just South of San, uh, just South of uh, San Francisco. And he's a rangeland ecologist botanist with the Mid Peninsula Open Space District. And they are sort of unique in the sort of northern part of California in that they are the largest landowner of grazed land in, in the county they're in, that's in San Mateo County. Um, and so also dealing with, I think, uh, as well as constant challenges of keeping ranching viable. And we're gonna hear about you know, how they're using grazing to meet their conservation objectives. So, Lewis. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to share my screen here. Just let me know uh, when you can actually see the slides. Do you see the opening slide now? No. Try that again. All right. Now it's starting to work. Yes. Okay, great. We're good now. Thank you. I'm still getting the hang of some of these things. Um, your whole slide yeah, thank you today. for the introduction, Sheila, and um, thank you all for having me to be part of the summit today. Um, again, my name's Lewis Reed. I serve as the rangeland ecologist for Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. So we operate in sort of the peninsula region of the Bay Area. Um, we are a local agency oriented toward uh, protecting land. Um, and what I want to share with you today is just sort of another case study of our conservation grazing program um, and just give a little background on, on it uh, as part of our overall operations and a little bit of how we see it fitting into uh, meeting our conservation goals. Um, so I'm going to start by, by putting up um, our mission statements here, and I'll just highlight a couple things. Our original mission statement from back in the 70s when the district was established really was focused on protecting and restoring the natural environment and providing opportunities for public enjoyment. Um, as the district grew and began to approach uh, coastal San Mateo County, a region that has a lot of um, uh, agricultural land use, uh, we heard from the community that uh, there was a lot of concern and interest in having agricultural conservation be part of that work. Uh, so we developed a new mission statement that was uh, oriented toward our work in coastal San Mateo County that included, you know, in addition to our original conservation goals, preservation of agricultural lands and uh, encouraging viable agriculture use on those lands. Uh, our conservation grazing program, which was developed shortly after that, is, is uh, a place where um, uh, our mission statements come together quite nicely. Um, it is very much focused on protection and enhancement of, of uh, biodiversity that's unique to our region's grasslands, which is a major land cover in coastal San Mateo County. Um, we also also have a fuel management component, so we very much see the cost to reduce risk of catastrophic uh, wildland fire. Um, and it's a great way that we can help uh, um, 
uh, provide that component of our mission about um, supporting viable agricultural use. And so we work with local ranchers to uh, steward grasslands on these uh, preserves. Um, I'll take a, a big step back and just talk briefly about biodiversity, the uh, focus of our summit this year. Um, and I think this has been sort of highlighted at various points throughout the day, but just to drive it home, uh, we live in a region that is uh, globally recognized for its biological significance. And uh, as Lynn and others uh, pointed out very well, that um, our grasslands and rangelands are a critical part of supporting that biodiversity. Um, so uh, I know uh, folks here are probably familiar with this, but a lot of people think about biodiversity and conservation and think about tropical rainforest or think about tropical reef systems. Um, but we're learning more and more that, that uh, 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 our grasslands are a really important part of that. We have a few examples from our region here of some of that unique biodiversity. We also have uh, there's a picture of one in the upper left there. Um, uh, they rely on growing activity of other species, such as this American badger, another special status species that occurs in our grasslands. We have uh, incredible floristic diversity in these grasslands, which the state has become uh, quite renowned for our super blooms that draw all kinds of interest uh, in our landscape. So we have some of those species that are quite rare, such as this uh, artist popcorn flower in the lower right. Um, and others that are not rare in and of themselves, like this little uh, native viola, the Johnny jump ups here, uh, but our calippy silver spot butterfly uh, shown in the top here. Um, we even have native amphibians that rely on these grasslands, both reptiles and amphibians. Uh, here on the peninsula, we have uh, some strongholds for the uh, very endangered San Francisco garter snake shown here uh, that is very much associated with aquatic features on our rangelands. Um, and uh, similarly, the federally listed red-legged frog shown in the upper right. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll just point out that, you know, like, like some of our, our other native amphibians, a lot of the extant uh, breeding habitat for this red-legged frog uh, is livestock ponds on working locally. Um, and I'll just reiterate a point that uh, Lynn made in her of the rare or special status species in our state uh, are associated with grassland and mangeland habitats. Um, so we recognize that biological significance. We need to ask ourselves, what are the threats or challenges in managing that? Um, I put a few bullet points up here. I'm sure you can think of others. A big overarching one is land conversion. So if we take landscapes like the one in the background here and um, turn them into parking lots or shopping centers, we lose a lot of the biodiversity associated with them and it's very difficult to get back. Uh, so that's a big one, but you know, even once we set land aside and say we're not going to convert it, um, there are other factors at play. Uh, I'll just put a broad one here, altered disturbance regimes. We know that a lot of the species in our ecosystems evolved with various forms of disturbance. That could be different kinds of grazing, could be uh, fire regimes, either wildfire or human managed fire. Um, and that those disturbances are very important for maintaining appropriate habitat structure. Um, so I'll leave that one broad. Um, related with that, for us down here on the central coast, um, brush encroachment or the natural process of woody succession uh, is, is another factor that um, uh, plays into um, uh, maintaining grassland biodiversity or rangeland biodiversity. Um, we have, there's a very strong tendency on the coast here to uh, lose species rich grasslands, such as this little coastal prairie patch in the foreground, to uh, the process of uh, woody succession or brush encroachment, which you can very much see in the background of this picture here. Um, and the last one that, uh, you know, I don't think we can talk about grassland conservation in California without talking about invasive exotic species. Um, uh, we know 
that uh, many of our grasslands in California have become almost completely dominated by uh, invasive, invasive exotic plants. Um, and so this, this is, a, again, another challenge. Even once we've protected land from land conversion, we have to deal with all these other forces uh, that can threaten the biodiversity associated with those lands. Given uh, those known threats to that biodiversity, we have to ask ourselves, what can we do? Uh, and the first point uh, I put up here, let's go ahead and check that off. I think we understand pretty well uh, that in many cases uh, on our grasslands and rangelands, we do nothing, we could lose a lot of the biodiversity associated with these lands. Uh, so just fencing them off and setting them aside is not enough. Um, uh, we do have a variety of tools we can use to help uh, protect that biodiversity. You can see in the lower right, um, a land manager using uh, mowing to uh, mitigate brush encroachment and keep some of this grassland and rangeland habitat open. Um, there's a lot of interest in the use of prescribed fire for various conservation goals. Um, and, you know, in the case of invasive exotic species, targeted herbicide use can be a very important tool that we use. Um, and then last but not least, uh, I put grazing up here um, because more and more we're learning that we can use uh, livestock management to create habitats that are favorable to some of the species we're trying to protect. And uh, when we think about these very large landscape scales, uh, my program spans about 11,000 acres. I'm sure uh, many others out there are much larger. Um, you know, tools like grazing really rise to the top of our options of reasonable tools uh, that we can use to, to manage these lands. Uh, I've used the term uh, conservation grazing several times in this presentation. So I'll just clarify that all I really mean here is um, using livestock management specifically to move toward conservation goals. Um, and as uh, Lance mentioned, that doesn't need to be a compromise or a trade-off with uh, basic livestock production. Uh, but those of you who work with livestock management know that there are all these different parameters that we determine as land managers that in turn determine the influence of livestock management on the landscape. So we have to figure out what kind of livestock we're, we're working with, um, how many of the individuals are out there, how long, over what season, and how do we manage a dispersal of those animals in a working landscape to make sure that we get the impacts that we want in the places we want them and avoid impacts in places where we don't want them. Um, and then the last point that I'll just include here is the, the importance of monitoring. And I noticed that several people uh, in the chat in the earlier discussion brought that up as well. Um, with any management, how do we know if we're moving toward our conservation goals or, or whatever our goals are, if we're not following up and monitoring these places? Um, uh, I'll uh, wrap up here um, just by pointing out some of the functional ways that we see grazing fitting into um, habitat management here at Midpen. Um, one is just helping to maintain open grassland habitat. You know, for a species like this uh, short-eared owl in the upper left, this is another grassland raptor um, that, that relies on grassland habitat. You know, maybe this bird doesn't care so much if the grassland behind it is uh, native grassland pristine or non-native grasses, but it's probably really important just that there's open grassland habitat uh, for it to uh, hunt uh, and roost in. Um, another point is just, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to broaden this second point out and just say managing physical structure of grassland habitat, not always necessarily just short statured grassland, um, but that's another way that livestock can help us influence habitat parameters. And a, a good example is the burrowing owl that um, our previous speaker mentioned, and we also have burrowing owls uh, here on the peninsula. And one of the most important habitat parameters uh, for, for those uh, Western burrowing owls is just having vegetation under a certain height threshold. So livestock can help us uh, meet those goals. Um, maintaining aquatic features, we mentioned several uh, sensitive species um, in California rangelands rely on livestock ponds as uh, their primary breeding and foraging habitat. Um, and uh, beyond just having those ponds present, 
uh, livestock can help us, again, uh, manage the vegetation structure in a way that is favorable to those species. Here's a red-legged frog. Uh, this one's actually in a livestock trough, um, uh, which is not exactly what I'm talking about here, but, but really managing those ponds in the associated vegetation. Um, and uh, the last one I'll mention here again, and uh, appreciate that our previous speakers also touched on this, but uh, livestock can be very valuable in moderating uh, competitive force from exotic species in these grasslands. And so I've got a picture on the lower right here uh, uh, from one of our preserves uh, where we use livestock management. And uh, you can see for the botanically inclined that there's a nice stand of purple needle grass there and a nice complement of native uh, forbs or wildflowers that uh, in the ungrazed envir environment are often outcompeted uh, by exotic annual grasses that the cattle are very uh, effective at reducing. So those are some of the ways that uh, we see livestock management working uh, toward conservation in our rangelands. Um, I'll, I'll just wrap up with my take home points here, just that, um, just reiterating, you know, that, that our rangelands are a major uh, reservoir for the unique biodiversity we have that earns us a spot in that globally uh, recognized map of biodiversity hotspots. Um, so this is an important place to focus conservation efforts. Uh, grazing can be a very valuable and in some cases critical part of managing habitat on these lands to support biodiversity. And, um, and then I'll just conclude with, you know, that integrating grazing management in the habitat conservation can also be an important part of helping to sustain uh, our agricultural communities. Um, so uh, thanks again for having me as part of the panel. I'll be uh, around for questions. Okay, we're gonna move to questions and you might've seen in the chat that all the videos are off because we were having some problems with connection while Lewis was speaking, but um, Anyhow, so uh, I'm going to start with a question to uh, that I want to ask to all the panelists, but I start in the south there with Lance and Tracy, and and you both mentioned a lot of challenges in having ranchers um, be available, be viable. So I'm interested to know what are you doing to sort of meet those challenges, or or what are some of the the strategies that are maybe you're thinking about to sort of keep ranching as a viable resource tool in your area? I guess I can start with that. Um, the work that the, the San Diego MMP is doing around this grazing study, um, I think is really gonna help the larger community uh, feel more comfortable bringing grazing back onto reserve lands. Um, and in terms of, you know, the ranching community, I think we need a lot of help down here still <laughs> in that regard. Um, I think that's still a open question on how that's going to move forward, um, especially as the climate warms and potentially dries. Tracy, would you have anything to add? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I got a phone call I had to mute. Oh, so so you mentioned some challenges with having having ranchers and there's you know few to choose from. So what are some of the things that you are doing or considering, maybe considered doing to sort of help support the uh, uh, availability of ranchers or keeping them viable for resource management? Well, there's been times when that conversation has been a bit one-sided uh, due to a lack of, you know, connection with ranchers, John Ostel, uh, who may want to pipe in here, um, has been instrumental in being kind of the, their, the rancher aspect, the community go-to person to discuss more connection. And we've tried to foster more connection through the outreach, um, like what RCD is doing uh, they have a monitoring effort here and it in the grant includes additional outreach so so we're trying to foster outreach but honestly i mean the number of 
producers or livestock owners in the county is low. And I, we have a lot of <coughs> partners that, that are interested in goats. There's like almost nothing for them to engage in with regard to somebody who runs goats in the area. So it's, I think it's going to be a multi-layer effort and it's, 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 it's forming, but it is not yet fully mature for us to be able to make those kind of connections easily. And I, I definitely see an upcoming challenge as more reserves try to bring livestock on, um, on everybody wanting livestock at all the same time. <laughs> and yep. so I think there's going to be a supply and demand issue there. And Lewis, um, same question to you. So uh, what what does the district in uh, Midpin doing to sort of meet the challenge of keeping ranchers viable? Yeah, thank you, Sheila. I, I think there's a lot of different components to that. And I think one of the, the first ones is just um, making land available, you know, and we, uh, in general, when we're moving into agricultural areas and acquiring properties that have historically had grazing, we try to keep that in place. Um, and we have a couple of cases where we've actually um, uh, recently reintroduced grazing to lands that had not been grazed for quite some time. Um, I, I think that's a big piece and it, and it helps the, um, uh, just sort of the regional pool of um, livestock operators to remain viable. Um, most of the folks that we work with manage multiple holdings, some private, some public. And so we're, we are a piece in that uh, sort of portfolio of resources that sustain the local ranching community. Um, another one is that we invest quite a bit in infrastructure. Um, especially some of these sites that had not been grazed for a long time. Um, as uh, Lance mentioned, often have very dilapidated infrastructure. And so we invest a lot in updating fencing and uh, developing water resources um, to make these viable operations. Um, and, uh, and quite recently, we actually uh, adjusted our uh, AUM rates to account for some of the challenges in, in um, operating on these very rugged landscapes for our uh, tenants that we work with. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be almost out of time here, but I, um, Tracy, there's a couple of questions in the chat. If you could address them in the chat, and then um, we can see those answers because they're directly had to do with your presentation too. And um, and then I just want to end with um, so Teresa was. Uh, crediting Lynn for this quote. I think it's Lynn often presents this quote, which is, I think from a, came originally, I, we should let Lynn say who it was from, but um, uh, that you can't put the animals on a, on a shelf. So um, when you need them and then when you don't need them. So, so thinking about, you know, keeping uh, ranchers viable year around is, is obviously uh, one of the challenges as well as, you know, having them present first place. So, um, and, uh, and there's some other comments there in regards to that. So um, please uh, read in the comments as well. So thank you both for, thank you all three of you for your presentations. And I will turn back to um, Michael Delbar.